Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. Welcome to The World Over Live. The U.S. Bishop's Fortnight for Freedom campaign kicked off today. Two weeks set aside by the bishops for prayer, reflection, and activism, all focused on the cause of religious freedom. Coming up, a very special World Over. Each guest will offer his perspectives on the religious liberty challenges facing the church and society at large. And what guests they are. The former president of the Catholic Bishops' Conference, Cardinal Francis George, is here. The Archbishop of Chicago will tell us the grave impact the government's contraceptive mandate could have on church institutions. And later, the Archbishop of Washington and a member of the Bishops' Religious Liberty Committee, Cardinal Donald Wuerl, is here. He'll share the purpose of the Fortnight for Freedom and tell us what his archdiocese is planning. And finally, Bishop Robert Morlino of Madison, Wisconsin, will discuss religious liberty and offer his thoughts on the federal budget proposed by Congressman Paul Ryan. The nuns on the bus tour visited his diocese this week to protest the Ryan budget. Bishop Morlino has his say straight ahead. He'll speak out for the first time. As always, we want to hear from you, so drop us an email at worldover at EWTN. Com. Let's get things started. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. More church bombings in Nigeria. This time, a Catholic cathedral was among the targets. Dozens of people have been killed. The Islamist terror organization Boko Haram claimed responsibility for three attacks on Sunday and four more on Monday. The attacks have led to a series of reprisals and counter-reprisals between Christians and Muslims. At least 138 people have died since Sunday, according to officials. Early Thursday, according to the Associated Press, Boko Haram said in an email that it had launched multiple attacks in the city of Damaturu. At least 40 people were killed there. On Wednesday, Pope Benedict XVI expressed deep concern over the escalating violence and appealed, quote, for an immediate end to the killing of so many innocents. And pro-lifers scored a victory at the United Nations Sustainable Development Conference in Rio. Led by the Vatican delegates at the Rio Plus 20 conference, successfully removed any mention of reproductive rights or population control from the final report. The Catholic Family and Human Rights Institute reported that the Holy See and Russia were quick to point out that using the term reproductive rights in the same paragraph as family planning was a clear attempt to promote population control, namely abortion, as a means of achieving sustainable development. The pro-life win puts an end to a six-month effort by the UN Population Fund and International Planned Parenthood to promote both abortion rights and population control at the Rio conference. The initial bid to include the reproductive rights language in the final document was supported by New Zealand, Australia, the EU, as well as Canada and the U.S., among others. And a stunning claim of widespread euthanasia in Great Britain. Neuroscientist Patrick Pulsino told the Royal Society of Medicine that doctors are prematurely ending the lives of thousands of elderly patients in government-run health care. Under a palliative care protocol called the Liverpool Care Pathway, food and water are withdrawn from patients whose death is deemed imminent, according to the UK Daily Mail. More than 130,000 hospital patients died under this government-approved plan. Pulisino claimed that doctors now routinely use the protocol on elderly patients who could recover. Their rationale? They need the hospital beds, and some elderly present nursing challenges. Euthanasia in the UK is now associated with 29 percent of hospital deaths, according to Pulisino. Meanwhile, the High Court in British Columbia has ruled that a provincial law banning euthanasia is unconstitutional. 
The decision would allow the plaintiffs in the case to be killed by a doctor. Archbishop J. Michael Miller of Vancouver has asked the government to appeal this extremely flawed and dangerous ruling. And back in the U.S., in New York, a lesbian employee of the Catholic-run St. Joseph's Medical Center in Yonkers has filed a federal class action lawsuit against the hospital for refusing to grant health insurance benefits to her legal spouse. The two married under New York's same-sex marriage law enacted last year. The hospital self-insures its employees and is regulated under federal, not state law. As a result, the hospital's policy of not insuring same-sex spouses is protected under the Defense of Marriage Act, which defines marriage as a union between one man and one woman. The hospital employee is arguing that the law is discriminatory and therefore unconstitutional. This past week at a White House reception celebrating Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual and Transgender Month, President Obama repeated his pledge not to defend the Defense of Marriage Act. And as the Catholic Church in America focuses the fight on religious liberty or the fight for religious liberty, a group of left-leaning religious sisters have set their sights on fighting Congressman Paul Ryan's proposed federal budget. Network, a D.C.-based lobbying group which backs everything from economic justice to ecological justice, began its Nuns on the Bus tour on Monday and got a ton of publicity. Sister Simone Campbell of Network, seen here at the tour kickoff in Des Moines, called the Ryan budget immoral. The sisters took that message straight to Congressman Ryan's district office in Janesville, Wisconsin, on Tuesday. Even though the Ryan budget has not passed the Senate and the president would never sign it. Sister Campbell suggests that Ryan's assertion that he used Catholic principles to shape his budget makes him a liar. Later in the show, Bishop Robert Morlino, who is Paul Ryan's bishop in Wisconsin, offers his opinion on Ryan's budget and reacts to the nuns on the bus in his diocese. And finally, in Australia, Pope Benedict established a third ordinariate for former Anglicans on Friday. Earlier this year, the personal ordinariate of the chair of St. Peter was established in the U.S., and the personal ordinariate of Our Lady of Walsingham was established in 2011 in England and Wales. These ordinariates are special church jurisdictions, similar to dioceses, which allow formerly Anglican communities to retain some of their liturgical traditions while being in full communion with Rome. Pope Benedict named former Anglican Bishop Harry Entwistle, now a Catholic priest, to be the first ordinary of the group. Father Entwistle cannot be ordained a Catholic bishop as he is already married. When we return, what are the possible consequences of the HHS contraception and sterilization mandate should the health care law remain in place? Cardinal Francis George of Chicago will tell us when the World Over Fortnight for Freedom special continues. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. You just saw the opening mass of this fortnight for freedom called by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. And we're very pleased to be joined now by Cardinal Francis George. He's the Archbishop of Chicago and the former president of the Bishops' Conference. Your Eminence, thanks for being with us. It's good to be with you, Raymond, and with all those who watch EWTN as well. I want to begin with uh, what we're seeing today unfold and get your opinion on exactly what is the greatest threat to religious liberty as you see it today to the church and to those who are, uh, you know, just members of the laity. Well, it's uh, a beautiful spectacle of prayer that we've just seen, and uh, that is the most effective response to the greatest danger, which is kind of diffuse, first of all. We have to get into a lot of more details, as you know. But it was brought up in our discussion uh, during the bishops' meeting, uh, particularly by John Garvey, the mm -hmm. president of the Catholic University of America, where he said the biggest problem is uh, that uh, religious faith 
and therefore love of God is far weaker. And so if we live in a culture that doesn't see the importance of love of God or the place of religion, well, then government intrusion will be more acceptable than if the culture were not so secularized. That problem of a secularized culture, of course, has been brought up now for 10, 15, 20 years by Pope John Paul II especially and by others who have noticed what has been happening slowly, uh, but surely in our own country and in others as well, perhaps more quickly in Western Europe and in Canada. But uh, here too, as the culture becomes more secularized, then intrusions into the church's mission are going to be more frequent by the government or by others as well. Mm -hmm. You raised the provocative question at the bishops' conference recently. Uh, you said, what if we lose? What if these, these cases don't go the way we wished? What if the Supreme Court allows this uh, law, the, the overarching health care law, on which this mandate hinges? If it remains in place, what should we do? Run through the options and the ones that you are weighing as the Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago. Well, uh, we need some help to figure out all the options. We haven't <laughs> discussed it well enough for long enough. Uh, the, the HHS mandate, as you know, has two components. One is the religious liberty, that is the identity of Catholic institutions, hospitals, universities, Catholic charities, uh, everything except our parish churches. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's the identity that's being taken away, which means that all these ministries that are built, built up and we thought were Catholic, the government is telling us, no, we'll tell you what's Catholic and what's not. That's the central constitutional issue. Mm -hmm. But it's raised because of what the government is telling us to do and not giving an exception for, namely telling us that we have to pay for actions that are immoral. Mm -hmm. So that is the focus of the bishop's concern about the HHS mandate as mm -hmm. it's being interpreted now. Uh, and it is law. It just hasn't come into effect yeah. yet. You, so what can we do if it does come into effect yeah. is your very good question, Raymond. Yeah, that's a good question that I wish I knew a better answer to. I mean, one, one thing is just wink and nod. You say, well, yeah. we'll still call ourselves Catholic even though we can't act like Catholics. And I suppose that's a temptation because it means then you can continue the services that you've been doing and even pretend that you're doing them as Catholic even though officially, publicly, you're not. That will be a temptation for some. Another temptation will be to just say, well, all right, we'll continue the services, but we won't do them uh, as Catholics. We won't do them in Christ's name. We'll teach, but not who Christ is. So you'll and secularize. We'll sick, but not out of love of Christ. We'll secularize them. And that, mm -hmm. we wouldn't do that, but we, we could sit there and watch them do it to themselves because that would be a function of their boards who would simply say we're no mm -hmm. longer Catholic. The ethical and religious directors don't govern our health care. We're not under the local bishop. We're just a secular not-for-profit hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, that could be done uh, legally very quickly. So that's a, a huge temptation because then they say we're doing it to keep our services going. Your Eminence, you uh, wrote a the piece other one would that, that was, that was uh, stark to, to my eyes and it sort of, you know, jolted me when mm -hmm. I read it. I remember sitting over coffee mm -hmm. and I, I spilled half the cup. You wrote, if you haven't, <laughs> if, if you haven't well, already... I'm glad it had that effect. I, I wanted it to have that effect. Well, you did. And <laughs> I, I want to share Thank this with you. people. If you haven't already purchased the Archdiocesan Directory for 2000, 12, you wrote, I would suggest you get one as a souvenir. On page L3, there's a complete <laughs> list of the Catholic hospitals and health care institutions in Cook and Lake Counties. And skipping ahead, you say, two lengths from now, unless something changes, that page will be blank. Do you really believe that? Well, I would, I would like not to believe it. I mean, it was said starkly. I sometimes do that. Uh, you do, too, and it gets mm -hmm. people's attention. Uh, but I would hope that that doesn't happen with all my heart. I have a hard time believing that it might because this is America. But it's there. Legally, it's there. Uh, they could still be there if they were willing to pay, that's the third option, a $2,000 fine per employee, or if they just simply, ironically, refused to insure for health care, even though they're health care institutions. There are a number of possibilities like that, that the institution would continue, but it wouldn't be Catholic anymore, so that page would be blank. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, I think we have to do a lot of thinking about this. What's... What is the solution? And also we have to realize that while the bishops can call these institutions uh, to uh, follow what we say, we don't own them, we don't govern them directly. Mm -hmm. And so there are going to be a lot of other actors in making the decision about what should be done. What would you do, Hopefully Cardinal we won't George? get there. I mean, uh, you, shouldn't, shouldn't you stay and fight? I mean, how, and how do you fight uh, as, as, a, as a church and as an archdiocese? 
It, what, if the, what if the law doesn't if, change? If you're stuck with this mandate, if they're saying you have to provide abortifacients, contraceptives, and sterilization services to all those folks who work for you in hospitals, in schools, what do you do? And you're saying you don't want to secularize them. Right. And you don't want to just wink, wink and nod, because that's not honest. Right. So you can pay the fines, $2,000 a head. Mm. Uh, but you can't do that for very long, can you? No. Uh, what you do then is what we're doing. You go to the courts, and uh, maybe you refuse to pay the fines, and then you get fined some more. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are legal options that we're now pursuing yeah. uh, in the courts and in other ways. And so when you exhaust all the legal options and there is no other way out, then you've got a really hard decision. Yeah. Now, Cardinal George, and we're talking to His Eminence, uh, Cardinal Francis George of, of Chicago. Your Eminence, uh, you all faced a historic situation not too many years ago just like this, where you had Catholic charities who had been for 30 years in a partnership with the state providing exemplary adoption and foster services, and yet when the same-sex marriage law passed, or the civil unions law rather, passed there civil in union. Illinois, mm -hmm. it essentially put all of the Catholic charities out of this uh, adoption and, and foster care business throughout the state. Uh, your archdiocese had already ceased those services earlier. Uh, doesn't that history tell us what may befall the church in its other social service outreach as a result of this mandate? Uh, yes, it certainly does. Uh, in this case, the institutions continue. They stop their services. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the case of hospitals, you can't stop taking care of the sick and remain in a hospital. So it's even more urgent. Uh, so Catholic Charities does many other things in all the dioceses. It can withdraw, right. unfortunately, from a fine service to children and to families and still be Catholic Charities. Mm -hmm. But hospitals can't withdraw from health care and still be hospitals. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a, a more difficult situation for them. What do you say to those, uh, your eminence, who say, look, you're taking federal money, you're in a partnership, so you have to move with the public will, and the elected officials are saying, you have to do X, Y, or Z. Isn't that part of the deal when you accept federal funds? Well, that really has nothing to do with it because institutions that don't accept any federal funds still have to uh, conform to this. We have uh, some uh, Catholic Charities organizations that uh, receive no federal funds. It's all done by private uh, subscription and, and the generosity of many Catholics in Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, taking care of children, etc. They have to conform to this. So accepting federal funds has nothing to do with this whatsoever. This is universal law no matter where you get your money. Mm -hmm. Your Eminence, you took some issue with uh, starting this fortnight and invoking uh, Thomas More. This is uh, the feast day of St. Thomas More, the kickoff of this fortnight for freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, why were you concerned about that, about the, the invocation of Thomas More? <laughs> we know he died for his faith. Uh, what, what, what is your yes. concern? Well, he died for his faith. That's why he's a martyr. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that was perhaps something that I should have uh, let uh, stand because President Garvey gave a marvelous talk. And what he said was what I started out with. If the love of God is strong, uh, then uh, people won't permit government or other agencies to intrude upon the church's ministries. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's very true. I, I was just thinking historically, and uh, in fact, Thomas More did love God, but he died also for the truths of the faith. And it was because uh, in a pre-Enlightenment society, that was a late medieval society, mm -hmm. truth was still a public virtue, not only love uh, and not only justice, but truth. And so the truths of faith were part of the public fabric of governance. And uh, he died for them, and that's why he was killed, in fact. He certainly did love God, but it was the truth of the faith that he died for. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say uh, to President Obama, if given the chance, about this accommodation that has been offered to the church? Basically, only those institutions that only serve Catholics and only employ Catholics would be granted this a religious exemption under this mandate. What would you ask for, and what would you say to him? Well, that isn't the accommodation. The accommodation uh, refers uh, rather to how you pay for the immoral services. Right. But it isn't accommodation at all. As you know, I'm sure it's been reported mm -hmm. uh, very clearly that, uh, in fact, the law was registered exactly as it was written before the right. accommodation. So the accommodation didn't amount to anything. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I think uh, the president often says that he had experience working with uh, institutions that are Catholic when he was a community organizer in Chicago. He has great respect for that. And I would just like to talk to him about uh, what uh, he thinks is uh, possible 
uh, when those institutions no longer exist as Catholic. Uh, it'll be a change. If he would come back and work here five years from now, if that law is in effect, there would be no such institutions that he cooperated with. And I think he might, uh, I hope, would understand that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. we'd have to see, wouldn't we? Your Eminence, I don't expect to have that conversation. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see. On June 16th, <laughs> yeah. you had a uh, you had a, your own uh, event for religious liberty to raise awareness for the cause and uh, ra heighten people's awareness of the good work that's being done there in the archdiocese. Uh, you've been calling for the laity to get involved and reminding people that the laity yes. have their own role. What should they be doing at this time? Well, that event was a good case in point. That was not an archdiocesan event, even though there were some archdiocesan personnel there. Mm -hmm. And uh, like many other bishops, I sent a message. I didn't, I wasn't in town to appear personally, but uh, uh, those are f the things that uh, have to be carried by, by lay people because if it's obvious that only the bishops are leading this, then we're isolated. And it will become what the government keeps saying. It is a war on women conducted by uh, celibate male men. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, the lay people have to take it just for political purposes, but also because that's their vocation. You know, as we've talked about before, lay people are to govern the world. Uh, the mm -hmm. church is to govern by the bishops, and we do a bad job of it, and sometimes a good job of it. Mm -hmm. So the world too is a very mixed reality. But it's the vocation of lay people to mm -hmm. uh, govern, and this is certainly a worldly uh, challenge. So mm -hmm. anything that lay people can do, pray first of all, obviously, the people of mm -hmm. faith. And that will that will carry the day in God's time, but that's always not not always our time. Yeah. So rallies such as that, most of all, putting pressure. You know, when you go in and talk to somebody in government, you've had that experience. They mm -hmm. they look at you and they wonder. They don't ask you directly how many votes <laughs> do you control. Yeah. You know, I, that's natural enough. They're there. They want to get reelected. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it's uh, they know that the bishops don't try to control votes. So. Mm -hmm. They'll listen more likely to some lay woman, lay man who comes in and says, my whole family's upset about this, and uh, you should listen to me. Help. Your Eminence, before I let you go, we've been hearing so much reporting uh, and so much focus on the Leadership Council for Women Religious and their controversy with the Vatican, the critique the Vatican issued, uh, the doctrinal assessment several weeks ago. It is being mm -hmm. played as if uh, the Vatican is somehow curtailing the conscience of the sisters and the nuns, and I use oh. the nuns as if it's a universal term because that's the way it's reported. <laughs> uh, your thoughts yeah. on this and what are people missing about this story? Uh, what they're most missing is that this is a story about ideas and not about people, but it is hard to separate ideas and people, and mm -hmm. the press never does, because it's more interesting when you talk about people. Yeah. Ideas gets them into a realm that uh, isn't so reportable. Um, and it's uh, the ideas of the leadership conference itself, not of sisters who are working in parishes, et cetera, mm -hmm. but of uh, their leaders as they come together in the assembly and the papers that are read there and the motions that are passed there. Mm -hmm. This is... Uh, very limited, but it has huge repercussions because all of us we were raised by religious women. I remember the name sure. of every single sister who ever taught me in grade school, so great was the influence. And so whenever sisters are look like they're being attacked, of course, there's a reaction of love and concern. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, uh, it isn't focused well, sometimes deliberately by groups that have their own agenda, sometimes uh, by others. When it first broke and I talked to the uh, leadership uh, conference of women religious president, the new president, Sister Pat Farrell, mm -hmm. uh, she made it very clear to me that this is a conversation between the Holy See and the sisters. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, we should not interfere. Uh, the bishops should not. And so, mm -hmm. we, we, you know, we've tried to be supportive, certainly, of the initiative of the Holy See because we understand that's a doctrinal concern that touches sure. the faith. It's very important. But also the sisters, if many sisters who are working in our parishes are hurt by this in some fashion, we've tried to be supportive of them too as pastors so that mm -hmm. the unity of the church isn't destroyed by this. That's a pastoral concern, so the bishops are in it. But these are papal orders. We don't mm -hmm. control those orders. We don't run their internal governance at all. They're not mm -hmm. accountable to us. They're accountable to the Holy Father. Mm -hmm. So this is a discussion between the Holy Father's agency, the CDF, Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, and the Sisters' Leadership Conference itself. Mm -hmm. And until they're ready to say something and invite us ourselves to say something, I think what we should do is pray for the unity of the church, pray for the sisters, pray for the Holy See, 
and uh, pray for the dialogue that Archbishop Sarton has asked for. Uh, and he's such a good man, as you know. Yeah. Uh, he will be uh, very, very, uh, you know, supportive of the mm -hmm. mission the Holy Father has given him, but also of the sisters to whom he's talking. And Bishop Sartan has been uh, placed in charge of overseeing the rewriting of the statutes and working with the sisters to help uh, organize right. future conferences, etc. Your Eminence, That's Cardinal right. Francis George, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Raymond. It's always good to talk to you, and God bless you and your listeners as well. Thank you very much. And uh, the World Over will continue in a moment. Cardinal Donald Wuerl of Washington, D.C. will join us when we continue. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. We are joined by Cardinal Donald Wuerl. He's the Archbishop of Washington, D.C., and a member of the U.S. Bishop's Ad Hoc Committee on Religious Liberty. Your Eminence, thanks for being here. You're on very this, welcome. On this important night, the kickoff of the, of the fortnight, tell me, what are the plans for the Archdiocese of Washington? I want to start there. I know you have a rather ambitious uh, plan in this diocese. Well, we do. The next step in the, in the fortnight is a rally we're going to have. We're going to have this at George Washington University. And the whole idea is to bring a lot of our young people, young adults, so that we can, in this rally, with music, with the video, uh, with hymns, uh, with a narrative, tell the story of religious liberty in America. Mm. And then we're going to conclude with Benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. And I hope uh, that we will have a rousing at the end of all of that, Holy God, we praise thy name, because that's one of those hymns that every Catholic yeah. can sing. But the whole, the whole purpose of this is to tell people the story of religious liberty. Mm -hmm. I mean, it goes all the way back to the beginning, whether it was pilgrims who landed in New England or the Ark and the Dove carrying Catholics who landed in Maryland, Southern Maryland, 1634. Think of it. That long ago. And what did they establish? They established the first law of religious liberty. That was the first charter in the New World for anything. And it was religious liberty. So we're going to try to tell that story. And then, of course, as you know, during the week, we're going to have in parishes uh, throughout that entire uh, two-week period, we're going to have local celebrations, uh, local gatherings. And then, of course, the great conclusion uh, on the 4th of July is going to be at the Basilica of the National Shrine oh. of the Immaculate Conception. And, of course, we'll see you there because... Oh, the, we'll be covering all of yeah. this, including the rally. We're sending a crew to the rally, so we'll bring you some highlights of that. Monday mm -hmm. night, we have a, a special edition of the World Over. This upcoming Monday, we'll be bringing some excerpts there. Oh, well, that's wonderful. It's That rally, I think, will be uh, not only educational, and I'm sure it will be, because I'm not certain most Americans realize how much religious liberty as a, as a reality was woven into the fabric of our nation from the beginning. Mm -hmm. But we want it to be inspirational, too. We want people to come out of that rally saying, I am so glad I am both American and Catholic. I'm so glad that I am part of a free country and I want to be a part of keeping it that way. Tell me about this Minute to Win It campaign you all are launching, in addition yeah. to a rather robust media blitz here in the, in the diocese. Well, the idea of the Minute to Win It is to have people pray. You know, at the heart of who we are as church is prayer. That's when we're at our best, when we pray. And we know God hears us and the response to what our needs might be is always conditioned by how well we pray. So the idea is to take this small, short prayer and invite people to say it over and over every chance they get. This minute to win it, to win the fight for freedom. And that prayer is on sacredproperty.org, just so people can, uh, can find it. Sacredproperty.org, and you'll find the prayer, and you'll find the story of what we're all about. Fantastic. And you mentioned, you mentioned that we're going to be uh, doing a lot of, of publicity. We're going to do a lot of information sharing during that period of time, because we found uh, as... People you, just don't know the history, and they don't realize what's at stake here. Yes, yes. Think of what it would mean if, and here's at the heart of our concern, mm -hmm. if that embedded definition remains, mm -hmm. if that definition constricting religion 
basically to what you do inside the four walls of your right, church. And basically what they, the accommodation, the definition of, of a religious institution according to the administration and HHS, Health and Human Services, is you must serve only Catholics, you must employ only, only Catholics. If you do anything other, you, you're disqualified and therefore you have to follow the dictates of this mandate. Now imagine, imagine what that would be like if you took that same mandate, that same narrow definition, and you applied it to our schools. Mm. You know, in our Catholic schools, we're very proud of the fact that we, we educate a lot of non-Catholics, mm. especially here in the In the center. inner city schools, it's predominantly non-Catholics. Yeah, yeah. and, and they work. Our schools work, mm -hmm. the kids come there, they get an education, and they get a life. In fact, that was one of the things I remember a youngster saying to me at one of our inner city schools when I said, now tell me, why, why do you come here? It was one of these miserable wet days, mm -hmm. and it was, and this youngster, he happened to be a fourth grader, but he put his hand up and I called on him and he said, I come here so I can get an education and get a life. Mm, and I beautiful. thought, you, you have it all put together. He got it. He got, got it. it. Lay this out for people, the consequences of accepting this mandate as it remains, as it, as it is written today. If that goes forward, and it's law today, no. if it continues to be so and the Supreme Court next week does not strike down the overarching law that's a part of this, what will you do in the Archdiocese of Washington, and what have been the consequences in the past? Well, you've touched on a number of elements that I would just like to reaffirm. Mm -hmm. First of all, it is law. Mm -hmm. We're not waiting for something to materialize. It's mm -hmm. already law. That's why we've gone into court. Our conference, the Conference of Bishops, went to the administration and said, we can't live with this. Uh, we really didn't get anything back. Mm -hmm. We went to the legislature, we went to Congress, and Congress hasn't been successful in doing anything to overturn it. Yeah. The only remedy left for us is to go into court, and that's why we're in court. Uh, I, I think right now there's already uh, a Supreme Court ruling coming down the road. Yep. Uh, that wasn't our suit. But we'll see what it says. We'll see what it leaves intact and what it overturns. Yeah. Then we'll be in a much better position to know where we are as a church. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, uh, as you know, we have these 12 lawsuits involving 43 different entities, mm -hmm. hospitals, universities, dioceses, Catholic charities, all saying we have to get rid of that definition mm -hmm. for the very reason you pointed out to say that we're not Catholic if we help other people who mm -hmm. aren't Catholic. Well, it wipes away an awful lot of the gospel, doesn't it? Yeah. And one of the things that I, I cited when having this discussion, and I cited it at the bishops' meeting just recently, Pope Benedict summed up for us very, very succinctly, as he does so well in so many areas. He said, you can identify the presence of the church. There are three essential elements. When, when the church is preaching the word, celebrating the sacraments, mm -hmm. and carrying out the works of charity, then you know the church is present. And he said all three of them are inseparable. And now what the government has attempted to do is tell us, well, it's all right if you want to celebrate your, your sacraments. Right. Do that uh, in private. Do that in private. But don't, and you can even preach in private, mm -hmm. but don't think that helping the poor, educating children, reaching out to those in need should be considered part of your religious faith. Hmm. Now, you've already lived through this on a smaller scale and maybe a not so small scale here in the Archdiocese of Washington in 2010. You had the, the DC government saying, we have a same-sex marriage on the books. You will, as a church, adopt and allow foster children to go to same-sex couples. You all made a decision as a result of that because there was no religious exemption given you. No, that was the unfortunate part about, there were two parts to that mm -hmm. legislation. You know, when that, when that legislation was first introduced, uh, we, we met with and we talked with uh, the people in authority, mm -hmm. uh, the people on city council to say, uh, how's, this, how's this going to work out? Because remember, we're a part of this community and we're doing an enormous amount of good in this community. Mm -hmm. And we were told, 
there are going to be two things that will happen. The new law will redefine marriage, and it will not provide a religious exemption. Hmm. So um, we had no alternative. We certainly presented the teaching of not just the church. Mm -hmm. This is the teaching of humanity about what constitutes a marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, why it is that the word marriage is attached to a man and a woman coming together, pledging to live together for the rest of their lives, have children and raise them. We said that's the definition of marriage. You, you can't change that. But once they did, and then they said now, if you're going to provide care, mm -hmm. adoption, foster care, you have to accept this definition. And here in the district, what made it so difficult was the, the way the legislation is written, the way things work here, the church would have had to be the guarantor of the marital, marital status of mm -hmm. the couple adopting the child. And we said, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, they simply said, well, then you're no longer eligible. And so now you simply don't do those ser perform those services. You shuttered the operation. You can't do those things and still mm -hmm. be who you are. Are you worried about the hospitals and the schools and the, 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 the outreach to the poor in this diocese as a result of this HHS mandate? Are you yeah. concerned it could go down the same way and you may have to shutter all these operations? Well, that's why we're in court. That's why we're in court. And I, I believe that when this is brought to the highest level of the judiciary, that the basic fundamental freedom of religion is going to prevail. Mm -hmm. I, I just find it difficult to believe that 200 years of tradition, 200 years of jurisprudence, 200 years of constitutional law would simply be wiped away. Mm. I mean, it could happen. Yeah, no, they did it in California. They did it in Illinois. They all petitioned the courts. The archdiocese is there. And in California, it was identical to this situation. Yes, the one thing that we have going for us is we do have the, the federal act mm -hmm. on the restoration of religious liberty, mm -hmm. which they don't have at a state level. Uh -huh. And so that is, that's one more barrier that those who are trying to wipe away that freedom of religion have to get over. The thing I keep hearing from my peers in the media, and if you read papers across the country, the common line, when this is covered at all, and it's rarely covered, let's be honest, if you were a nun on the bus, you'd get wall-to-wall -wall coverage, but being a cardinal in the, in the public square, eh, not so much. Um, they keep saying, what about the separation of church and state? And you would say what? There, the church has always been an integral player in society, in community, in the common good. We're an integral player in the works of, of our nation. And so to say, well, you can't, you can't function as a church because somehow we've come up with this new understanding of separation of church and state, it was never understood that way up until just right now. Mm -hmm. The Catholic Church is the largest provider of, next to the government, next to state governments and federal governments, of education, health care, social service ministry, mm -hmm. outreach to the poor. We're there because our faith tells us we need to be there. Mm -hmm. There is nothing impinging on the government. It's the other way around. It's the government who is saying to us, you can't do that now unless you meet these requirements. Okay. We have been free to do that. We've been a part of this whole effort for centuries. Yeah. What's changed yeah. other than the mentality that says we're really a secular country? And here's the difference. For all of these centuries, we've recognized the great, the great pluralism. We have ethnic groups from all over the world. We have religious groups from all over the world. We're proud of this, this beautiful mosaic made up of all of these entities. And now along comes a new world view, a secular view that says, you know, it should all be one color, it should all be gray. Hmm. It should all be done just by us, the us being government. Hmm. And uh, I think the legitimate answer is, what about the history of our nation? What about the heritage of all of us? What about the way we've been doing it? Shouldn't that count for something? Final question, what should the laity be doing during, not only during this fortnight, 
but beyond. What is their role in all of this? You know, Catholics are so accustomed to looking, looking up at the pulpit and waiting for the bishop or the yeah. parish priest to do something. In this arena, in this moment, this is really a lay effort, it's, shouldn't it be? You are right on target, 100% on target. This, the one thing that all our faithful lay people can do is speak up. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a time to be on our knees in prayer, and then there's a time to stand up, to stand up for who we are, to stand up for what's right, to stand up for the truth, to stand up for the rights of our church, which includes all of us. How can that be done? Two things, and now it's the minute to win it, the prayer. Yeah. Pray, pray, but speak up. Yeah. Every one of us has a voice, and you're, the way you described it is historically exact. We always waited for the priest to say something. Right. And if we, if we thought something was wrong, we would say, well, eventually the bishop will say something. Mm -hmm. Now, politicians are saying to us, Bishop, we hear from you, we never hear from your people. Thank you, Your Eminence, and we will be covering all the, the rally here in D.C., as well as the big closing mass at the Basilica, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You can all follow all of their activities at sacredproperty.org. They've got some great resources there. Coming up, Bishop Robert Morlino, and much more. The World Over continues in a moment. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. We're joined by Bishop Robert Morlino of Madison, Wisconsin, who happened to be in town, and I, I was delighted we could it's have him so on to, set. So I'm so glad to be with you. Right now, now, let's talk about what's at stake in your mind. And it's, it's great to have someone, you know, we've been interviewing a lot of folks from major cities and the coasts. What, for middle America in Wisconsin, tell me, what's at stake, do you believe, in this religious liberty fight? whether it's the HHS mandate or beyond? What's at stake is, well, the main thing that's at stake is, in fact, what we have in common with everyone else, mm -hmm. that our institutions, our hospitals, our schools, run the risk of having to forsake providing health care because of being forced to provide things that we cannot provide and that we will not provide under any circumstances. That is the main thing that's at stake for us. The, the evangelization that's taking place in the Diocese of Madison and in the Midwest happens largely, especially through our Catholic hospitals. And if we lose the ability to offer services to a wide range of people who are not Catholic and especially who are poor, if we lose the ability to offer services to them and are told what the limits of our religious activity can be. That is simply catastrophic. Mm -hmm. And there are many individual Catholics who are of very sound and well-formed conscience in the Diocese of Madison, and they in their own businesses do not see fit mm -hmm. to provide contraceptive coverage because it simply is wrong. And we have been fighting a battle in more recent years to correct the misunderstanding of conscience that became widespread after Vatican II, so that the conscience to be followed is the well-formed conscience. Mm -hmm. And now that we're getting that word out, now that people are getting enthusiastic about doing it, now that we've stood with them, to in any way to back away from that would, would just simply be impossible. Mm -hmm. So everything is at stake. You raise an interesting point, and we haven't addressed it yet on mm -hmm. the broadcast, that individuals, mm -hmm. small business owners, people who own mm -hmm. cleaning companies or restaurants, if, if they have, whether they're Catholic or not, mm -hmm. they're all going to be conscripted into providing abortifacients, sterilization services, and right. contraceptives via their health care plan, whether they right. like it or not. And the church is looking for a religious exemption, but there needs to really be a conscience exemption. Is that what you're it's arguing exactly, for? Exactly, exactly. And uh, we need both the exemption that allows us to define what our proper activity is, mm -hmm. and we also need to stand with people 
whose consciences that we've worked hard to help form by God's grace to stand with those people. And I, I think it would be uh, quite catastrophic if those people all of a sudden found us overwhelmed or whatever. We simply have to stand with them and we have to win this and by the power of the resurrection, we will run it. I don't have any question about that. Let's talk for a moment about uh, a messaging problem. There was some discussion at the bishops' mm -hmm. conference that perhaps there needed to be a central spokesman for the bishops' conference. I yes. thought that's what the president sort of did, mm -hmm. but, you know, the, whoever the president of the conference. But there was talk about hiring a spokesman. Do you have a messaging problem, particularly where this whole religious liberty argument is concerned? In, in the media, you pick up any paper, you, you listen to most broadcasts, what you hear is a bunch of celibate guys are waging war on women. And that is our message problem, and I, I don't know. I'm not against having a spokesperson, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure that that will solve the problem at all because there will always be those who will look to find some quotation from some bishop that will appear to be in disagreement or conflict with another bishop. Mm -hmm. And if that is played up enough in the media, mm -hmm. that becomes the word. And I don't think that we have the resources and the money to overcome that mm -hmm. uh, because the playing field is so uneven for us to play with major media outlets. Yeah. We're just not equipped. And of course, we are again equipped with the grace of the resurrection. And I think there are ways for us to uh, work our uh, hopes into reality here, but I'm not. I, we have to work hard to find out what those are. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that uh, something was said at the meeting. I was not able to be there, mm -hmm. but I had a minor health problem. But um, something was said at the meeting to the effect of. What happens if we had a spokesman and an individual bishop who has every right to do so says, well, I agree with what the spokesman said in substance, but, but his or her first priority is my second, mm. and his or her second priority is my first. Mm -hmm. That's all it would take. Mm -hmm. And we saw that, we saw that early in, this, in this, uh, the coverage of this religious liberty over the lawsuits. They, they, they took a, a quote from uh, Bishop Blair out in California and sort of misrepresented yes. it. He had to come out and issue a clarification because that one statement was exactly. perceived as, look, the bishops are in disarray. There's no agreement here. It is amazing, though. And have you ever seen the sort of unity from the bishops that we're seeing on this no. issue? Not since I've been in the conference, no. Mm -hmm. And we've come such a long way since uh, the days of uh, 1968 mm -hmm. and Humane Vitae and so on. And that's why I think it's so important for us to stay on course, mm -hmm. not to mix the issue of the morality of contraception with the issue of religious liberty. I don't want to do that. I don't think that serves our purpose. But as a matter of fact, that happens to be the issue again. Mm -hmm. And had there been a more unified voice in 1968, perhaps the lay of the land, perhaps the landscape for dialogue would, would look a little different mm. now. And that is the crux of the complaint against the leadership uh, of conference of women religious, uh, the Vatican's doctrinal assessment of them. And there is a tour now, Sister Simone Campbell and Network, which is a Catholic, liberal Catholic social justice lobby here in D.C. They're just a few blocks away here. Mm -hmm. uh, they are beginning a tour. They call it a nationwide tour on a bus to complain about Paul Ryan's budget. Now, Paul Ryan is a member of your diocese. In fact, they're coming to your diocese as part of this bus tour. Your thoughts on this? Is this an appropriate thing for a group of sisters to be engaged in at this moment during this fortnight? Well, the appropriateness of during the fortnight is to me secondary to the issue of the appropriateness in general. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would see it this way, that the sisters are technically lay people. Mm -hmm. By canon law, they are lay people. Lay mission in the church is, includes, and very importantly includes, the use of the political order 
to transform society mm -hmm. according to gospel values. Mm -hmm. So sisters are in a position to speak out, perhaps in a way that I'm not, okay. perhaps that I can't. And I don't want to fault them for that. But I really wonder if given the need to witness to Jesus Christ in the world through holiness, which is their functional specialty. Mm -hmm. The functional specialty of religious sisters is holiness. I don't like to put it that philosophically, mm -hmm. but it is. Mm -hmm. That's their major contribution, to witness to the holiness, which is the only thing that matters on Judgment Day. The world needs that witness so badly. Now, Congressman Ryan has made his prudential uh, judgment about how best to serve the long-term needs of the poor. He has done that in accord with Catholic principles. I don't have to approve his decision or his budget or anything else. Mm -hmm. What I do approve of is that he is a responsible Catholic layman mm -hmm. who understands his mission and carries it out very responsibly. Mm -hmm. I feel very strongly about that. The details of his solution are not mine to approve or disapprove. That's not my field. Right. And I think, though, that it would behoove the sisters, it would do them well, to think more along those lines. Because they have more freedom, if you will, to speak out, but they also are bound to ecclesial communion, especially with the Holy See. Mm -hmm. And when the Holy See asks, for cooperation. Mm -hmm. For instance, with this LCWR right. activity, the response ought to be cooperation. It ought to be obedience, really. Mm -hmm. Obe I'm obedient to the Holy See whenever uh, mm -hmm. I'm asked to be. Right. And I, I'm gladly that way. That's mm -hmm. the commitment I made. Well, I believe that's the commitment that the sisters also made. And we have to really get it straight, too, that it's not sisters in general. Cardinal Levada yeah. seems to be getting very frustrated mm -hmm. with the idea that, uh, again, some of the media have spread the word that the Vatican is indicting all religious sisters. Right. It's not that at all. Yeah. It's a very distinct group. It's a leadership have, conference of superiors that have doctrinally gone off the rails and they're trying and to they, help yeah, And they themselves. have obviously done some things very publicly that because they were done publicly, they require some kind of a public uh, correction. Mm -hmm. And that simply has to be taken. And I, uh, so I, I would think that the religious sisters, though, should concentrate on giving that witness of holiness of all the wonderful works that they do, rather than bussing around for political issues, because it's when, when anything happens like that, if I were to come out in a very political way, I would probably win more followers for the opposition. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are many Catholics who feel that very way about the sisters. They really don't like this. Uh, mm -hmm. They feel that their expectation from the sisters is really not this kind of leadership. Mm -hmm. Though there are a good number of Catholics who do expect this kind of leadership from the sisters and who encourage it. I'm not naive. No. I don't think they're no. there. Yeah. But I think, I think all of that is a mistake because that kind of activity does nothing but further divide an already divided church. And we have to work so hard for unity. Mm -hmm. And really, the sisters, when we look at it, the sisters more than anyone else built the church in the United States through the schools. Right. I've always believed that. Right. And I've always revered them for that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone else could have done it. Mm -hmm. But by God's grace, they were the chosen instrument and they did it beautifully. Mm -hmm. And when we're all working together, bishops, priests, and sisters, and lay people, Jesus Christ enters people's lives in a powerful way. And when we're not working together, they just look at us and say, well, they can't seem to find oneness in Christ. Right. What do they expect look from me? Look at this me? divided ruin over here. Yes. Yeah. And then, then you get carved up politically, mm -hmm. and that's no good for anybody. Right. Uh, what are you doing for this fortnight for freedom, uh, today being the big kickoff for two weeks? Uh, what are you doing in the diocese? Well, we're going to have uh, 
rosary uh, marches for the kickoff and then a week later leading to the uh, steps of the Capitol building mm. where we'll finish the uh, rosary. Uh, we're doing that on the 21st and on the 28th. On the 22nd, we're having a mass which coincides with our Thomas More Society mass, mm -hmm. which will be a focal uh, liturgical celebration for uh, religious liberty. And also uh, Bishop Swain, who used to be our vicar general, yeah. is coming from Sioux Falls to give a talk on religious liberty on the 22nd. Uh, after the mass, in another setting. Fascinating to see the local initiatives as, far, as well as these, uh, you know, big and, national masses. Uh, and yeah. then on the uh, 29th, we are going to join the celebration of ordination to the priesthood. We have two men mm -hmm. with our second major celebration for religious liberty, because what better witness to our religious liberty than to provide great priests for the future, mm -hmm. and to let the people see our. Uh, almost uh, 30 seminarians thriving wow. and doing so well. Fantastic. Bishop so, Robert Morlino, thank you so much for being with us, and I hope you'll come you, back. Thank you, Raymond. Great. Great to have you here. That is all the time we have, but before we go, contrary to the scant reportage, this fortnight for freedom is a massive national effort. We'll bring you highlights of the rally planned for D.C., there are many other activities occurring all over the country. In Denver, for instance, the Archdiocese is urging Catholics to fast during the two Fridays of the fortnight. In Pensacola, Florida, the diocese is hosting repeated showings of a man for all seasons. And on June 29th, the Catholic Conference of Kansas is planning a religious liberty rally at the State House in Topeka. I'll be providing updates and occasional commentary on all of this on twitter.com slash Raymond Arroyo. My Twitter and Facebook pages are linked at RaymondArroyo.com, so go there and click through. I posted the prayer the bishops have asked Catholics to pray during the fortnight on my Twitter and Facebook pages. Now, this Monday, June 25th, will bring you a special World Over Live. The Supreme Court could release its decision on the Obama administration health care law that day, and we'll bring you complete coverage. Mark Rienzi, the senior counsel at the Beckett Fund, will be joined by judicial expert and New York senatorial candidate Wendy Long. And throughout the fortnight, we have an amazing lineup of guests. Senator Marco Rubio will be here, Marianne Glendon, Bill Donahue, and I just learned today presidential candidate Mitt Romney will join us. We'll also, we've also issued an invitation to Vice President Biden, and uh, we're awaiting word. As Matty Stepanek, who died 12 years ago on June 22nd, said, peace is possible, even in this cause over religious conscience. Don't miss any of our fortnight coverage. In the meantime, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. We'll see you next time. Bye now. Thank <laughs> you.